A woman was led into a dark basement chamber by two armed guards. She was completely disoriented to her location. She could only remember days before tending to her family's crops. But for some reason, the secret police accused her of counter-revolutionary activities. So they took her away from her family and forced her onto a stuffy boxcar for what felt like days as the train chugged along into the Russian wilderness as she was transported to a distant prison camp. This basement was sweltering, the kind of heat that surrounded and clung to her skin. The stench of this place was only magnified by the heat. She wished for that infamous Russian cold. She endured at least two days of beatings and interrogations by the people who ran this place. The Cheka, as they're called. They'd been running around like a band of thugs ever since somebody tried to kill a top official in Moscow. She was their latest victim in their indiscriminate hunt for counter-revolutionaries. She was so weak from pain and starvation, she could barely stand. But the guards didn't care, as they practically dragged her limp body across the ground. They were trying to get her to confess to some phantom conspiracy she truthfully knew nothing about. She was just a peasant. True, her family was somewhat well off, but that was before the Bolsheviks took everything from them. The guards dragged her to a small iron door at the end of a dimly lit corridor. Stop! yelled one of the guards. The other moved to unlock the door in front of them. Disrobe! yelled the other one. She was terrified. Every sense of hers blocked her from doing so, but her hands had a mind of their own, and she started to undress. Of all the things the Bolsheviks have taken, now they're taking her dignity. But she knows if she doesn't do what they say, they will take her life. The guard before her opened the iron door. She couldn't see what was behind the door, but she could smell it. Her nose was assaulted by a putrid stench. Behind the door was a room, no more than maybe ten by four feet, and it was packed with at least eighteen stinking male prisoners, staring back at her with terrified gazes. There was barely any standing room. Some men were stacked on each other's backs or shoulders just to yield an extra inch of precious space. There was no toilet and there was at least one dead body laying in the muddy ground. And the air was so devoid of oxygen, not even a match would light. Move, yelled the guard, but she was petrified. God, no, she thought. They can't put me in there. She suddenly lurched forward. The guard shoved her into the cell. Then another guard drew his revolver and shot the closest prisoner point blank in the head. Then they closed the heavy door behind them and locked it, sealing them all in a dark, cramped, stinking hell pit. One of the guards kicked the woman's pile of ragged clothes away from the door before leaving those people packed like sardines to their fate. But this was all in a day's work of horrors perpetrated by the Cheka, the secret police, to make sure the Bolsheviks remained in power. And they went to any length deemed necessary by their puppet masters, Vladimir Lenin and Felix Dzerzhinsky to impose red terror upon the Russian people to submit to a dictatorship of the proletariat. From 1917 to 1922, the Cheka terrorized the Russian people into dedicating their lives to the Soviet state. Old institutions were destroyed, people were targeted on the basis of their socioeconomic status, and farmers were forced into collectives. Those who disobeyed were likely shot. The most unfortunate were subjected to sadistic torture not seen since the time of Ivan the Terrible. Under the leadership of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, the Bolsheviks seemed at first to bring real, much-needed change to Russia. They even abolished the institution of secret police at first, since many revolutionaries were hunted by the dreaded Okhrana. But it didn't take long for Lenin's true intentions to become clear, a dictatorship of the proletariat with himself at the helm. As you'll see, Lenin was a man with many similarities to those later deemed political enemies. He was unwavering in his faith in Marxism, but tweaked Marx's original writings into Leninism both in theory and in practice, because 
When it came to governing, Leninism was only achievable through the Red Terror unleashed by the Cheka. In this part three of Russian Secret Police, we will explore Lenin, the Russian Civil War, and of course, the Bolshevik Cheka. Their history, their methods, their organization and leadership. The big question here is, why did the Bolsheviks impose such a terrifying and murderous institution like the Cheka? How did the Bolsheviks tame the vast wilderness of Siberia? And how did the Cheka freeze human beings into literal human ice statues? You're listening to the Secret Police Podcast. Do you have a problem with authority? Because I do. So I like to explore the worst of it. And I'm on a mission to help us build a healthy skepticism towards those in power. I'm Jack Johannesson, and I spend hours per episode researching and engaging with my morbid curiosity of dictatorships. And I share with you the history and methods of the world's most brutal secret police forces. From the KGB to the Gestapo, we look at the people who do a dictator's dirty work and how tyrants unleash their secret police to strike fear in their people. In part two, we discussed the Tsar's secret police organization called the Okrana while sipping on Polish vodka. And we learned that secret police as an institution have been around a long time in Russia in various forms. But the Okrana distinguished themselves in their approach to infiltrating revolutionary groups inside and outside the Russian Empire. And the Okrana was early in adopting the use of fake organizations, such as labor unions, to entice factory workers away from more radical groups to their own. What was also different in this period was the revolutionary environment in which the secret police operated. Russia's last few czars saw unprecedented civil unrest inside some of the country's largest cities. Despite striking fear in the Russian citizens, and at least appearing like a formidable force, the Okrana was not up to the task of holding the revolutionary floodgates closed. Making things worse was the Okrana's rotting culture and systemic corruption. Some agents like Azov or Melanovsky made tons of money setting up illegal printing presses, having them busted, and enjoying the cash bonuses for their work. Undercover Okrana agents also killed government ministers and other officials to demonstrate their fake commitment to their revolutionary comrades. Other agents saw that the revolutionaries were fighting for a worthy cause, and they realized, hey, the Romanovs, they really do suck. So they defected, turning into double agents for one of the many revolutionary groups in Russia at the time. It was like a American-style all-you-can-eat buffet of revolutionary ideas. Ultimately, the Okrana helped bring an end to the Tsarist government by being incompetent and not being proactive enough to stop Lenin and the Bolsheviks. But it wasn't solely their fault, as other factors were at play, too. There were several overlapping factors, actually, that contributed to Russia's eventual embrace of Bolshevism. To me, this was a complicated topic to research and put together um, into some cohesive story because Russia in 1917 saw a, a well saw the culmination of a couple of historical events and a colorful cast of historical characters. And there was quite a bit of overlap. Of course, today our focus is on the Cheka and how they operated, but back to the Okrana for a second. Okay, part two was probably will be the most innocuous episode of the six episodes dedicated to Russia's secret, Russian secret police. For example, my, my research didn't indicate to me that torture was a part of the Okrana's playbook, at least systemically. It's a totally different story with the Cheka. This is your warning now that I will be describing in gruesome detail instances of torture. If that bothers you, I get it. It's not the most pleasant thing to read, especially um, reading and taking notes 
of this stuff before I go to bed. It's probably not great for my mental health. But like, it, but if you but if you don't want to listen to that, look, I get it. Before I share those parts, I'll I'll let you know how far I had to jump. Um, if you don't want to hear that stuff, it's it's on the level of Oprah's Nikki Gruesome, but with a lot more detail because the check has accounts of events. So, you know, is fairly recent. This is this only happened within the last hundred years, as opposed to five hundred or six hundred years ago. One quick thing before we get into this: stick around to the end of the episode because I have some pretty exciting announcements to share with you guys. Yay! The same brand of Polish vodka is making a second guest appearance here on the show, and I'm just gonna sip it instead of just announcing when I'm going to drink because. I actually thought that was pretty annoying when I when I was listening to my my own content uh, in part two. So feel free to join me if you are of legal drinking age in your country and are not currently driving or operating some kind of vehicle. Otherwise, you get you know, water, tea, coffee, juice. What else is there? Um, you know, your preferred variants of milk, almonds, coconut milk, whole milk, whatever, 1% nonfat. There are as many milk variants out there as there are COVID variants. Now for my quick and dirty recap of where we left off in part two. The Okrana was partially responsible for bringing down the Tsar because they undermined their own mission to protect him. They helped the revolutionaries a little bit too much. Additionally, Tsar Nicholas II was a weak leader. His only heir, Alexei, had hemophilia. So the family turned to noted dirty peasant, dirty peasant wizard and possible Hogwarts alumnus Rasputin. The family turned to Rasputin for magic to heal Alexei when science and medicine didn't seem to work. But one thing that could have been working out quite well for Rasputin was maybe possibly having less sexy time with the Tsarina while Nicholas II was out at the front trying to fight the Germans. Meanwhile at home, Russia was also experiencing famines that the government wasn't, or couldn't, do too much about. So to recap, uh, what, what do we got going on here? Russia was facing secret police helping revolutionaries, an incompetent czar, an heir to the throne who probably wasn't fit for service, a wizard who was porking the czarina, war and famine. Looking at all this together, I'm sure this won't lead to anything bad or dramatic happening. Nicholas tried to appease the increasing volume of critics by sharing his power with a Russian parliament known as the State Duma. The Duma, of course, had limited power, and Nicholas retained most of his. Suddenly, something bad happened. Russia's troubles culminated in several days of rioting in the capital, which was then Petrograd, the city that is now St. Petersburg. Nicholas II had very little support in reserve. I mean, it's scraping the bottom of the barrel at this point. The, the once powerful Tsar abdicated the throne and ended just over 300 years of Romanov rule. And the Tsar, with his family, went into exile somewhere in Russia. Meanwhile, the Okrana's activities were subject to an investigation by a special commission, which uncovered rampant corruption. Some agents became incredibly wealthy by busting their own printing presses, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, at the expense of Okrana resources. Despite the corruption, the Okrana successfully e expanded secret police operations and adopted new forensic and cryptographic technologies. They, they laid the foundation for future Russian secret police to, to build upon. To the Okrana's credit, if I'm going to be fair, outright terror was not part of their operations. Okay. A commission concluded that the Okrana undermined themselves and the government. And therefore the Okrana was dissolved in early 1917. Oops. The provisional government filled the power vacuum left over by the czar. It was, an assembly made up of ministers selected from the State Duma. A popular lawyer named Alexander Kerensky would eventually leave this leave lead. He would eventually lead the state or the uh, the provisional government. Yes, he would eventually leave it too, but we're getting to that. 
Let's talk a little bit about Kerensky. He's somebody that we could have talked about last episode. Um, I just decided not to, but better late than never. Kerensky was also born actually in the same town as Lenin. Um, the Ulyanovs, uh, Lenin's family, and the Kerenskys were actually part of the same educated middle class. He also went to law school, but unlike Lenin, he actually finished law school and went on to practice law and was actually very good at his job. He was a well-respected lawyer, um, as far as I could tell from research. Apparently, he was a, a great speaker and orator as well. Lenin was, you know, also known to be a great orator too, and even he didn't want to go face to face in a freestyle rap battle against Kerensky. That's how that's how good of a speaker Kerensky was. Now, in in terms of secret police regimes, this was a very unique time in Russia's history because for the first time since the Napoleonic Wars, Russia didn't really have a secret police force. Yes, some of the Okhrana's duties were delegated to a counter-espionage bureau, but the provisional government had a lot of conflicting priorities. They were trying to manage the mess left behind by the Tsar, which included a war with Germany. And it seemed the counter-espionage bureau was more concerned with German spies than revolutionaries. But revolutionaries were, of course, part of the chaotic backdrop. Uh, but this was a time period of relative peace between the average Russian citizen and their government. Now remember, revolutionaries lived under the fear of being arrested by the Okhrana. Factory workers unknowingly mingled with Okhrana agents at work. Russians abroad were tailed by Okhrana agents frequently. And this was just no longer the case. In 1917, for just a brief moment, the Russian government was not actually imposing fear and compliance upon the Russian people. Let that sink in for a moment and enjoy it. Because the lack of secret police would not last. In fact, Red Terror was just on the horizon. But why were Russians gradually denied the privilege of living their lives without forced loyalty or somebody breathing down their neck? 24 7. To answer this question, we have to understand the man at the center of this revolution, Vladimir Lenin. We can get a better understanding of the Cheka, too, by understanding how he came to power. Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov was born on April 22, 1870 in Simbirsk, Russia, now called Ulyanovsk, some 500 miles or 800 kilometers west of Moscow. Vladimir was fortunate to have a relatively happy childhood in a middle-class family with his mother Maria, father Ilya, and four siblings. His father was the director of schools for their entire oblast, or region. Papa Ulyanov looks exactly like Lenin with a bald head bushy goatee and mustache. Vladimir's mother taught the kids French and German in the home, and of course he spoke Russian. Clearly the Ulyana family was doing well. They were more educated than most in the Russian Empire. They weren't uh, oligarchs, but they were well off and comfortable within an intellectual class. Just his upbringing alone is one of the many contradictory aspects of who Lenin was and who he wanted the Russian people to, to be, as, as you'll see. Obviously, Lenin did not hail from the likes of the future proletariat, like the working class, but, the, but he so enthusiastically wanted to make them better off through communism. So Vladimir is sitting well and comfortable in Russia as a child. Good times, right? Vladimir's horizons broadened a bit outside of Simbirsk when his older brother Alexander moved to St. Petersburg to attend university. While in college, Alexander got caught up in a group of naughty radical revolutionary boys who wanted to topple the Romanov dynasty by killing Tsar Alexander III, so we've gone back here a little bit. Alexander Ulyanov was tasked by his group to make a bomb to kill the Tsar. 
Uh, last episode, we saw numerous examples of ministers killed by revolutionaries tossing the hottest of hot potatoes at them. The assassination plot against Alexander III ultimately failed and Alexander Ulyanov was arrested. While Alexander was incarcerated, Papa Ulyanov suffered a brain hemorrhage and died in January 1886. Young Lenin was just 15 when this happened, and it seems as a result he became more confrontational with people and was abrasive, probably just struggling and suffering from the loss of his father at a young age. I mean, who, who wouldn't, right? And he was probably dealing with those raging communist hormones coursing through his adolescent body. Later that same year, in May, Alexander Ulyanov was executed for the attempted assassination of Tsar Alexander III. This, coupled with the death of his father just months before, had a profound effect on Vladimir. Many sources indicate that Vladimir vowed revenge against the Romanovs for the death of his brother. Vladimir left Simbirsk for St. Petersburg to attend law school, but did not finish. Since his brother had been a dangerous revolutionary in the eyes of the Tsar's government, the Okhrana kept tabs on Vladimir's activities. He most certainly would have been on a no-fly list if such a thing had existed back then. They weren't wrong to keep an eye on him because, of course, Vladimir was frothing at the mouth for a revolution. In 1891, a famine swept across the Russian Empire. Because of the Ulyanov's relative financial security, they were largely unaffected, including Vladimir. But he understood that desperate times were more likely to push people towards revolution. So in his mind, the famine was a good thing. The worse things got, the higher the probability that Russians would topple the Tsar. I touched on this famine ever so briefly in part two. We learned that private citizens and volunteer organizations did more to provide famine relief than the actual government itself. The whole disaster was mismanaged and highlighted the government's incompetence or lack of giving two turds about the people. And it was an error that Vladimir could exploit. While at university, Vladimir got really into the writings of Karl Marx. Like, really into Karl Marx. This would probably be a good time to give you a basic idea of what Marx observed as the flaws of capitalism, what Marx proposed as a solution, and then explain the tenets of Leninism. This will be brief because while these ideas are important to understanding the philosophy of the Bolshevik Revolution, it's not as important to me as focusing on the Cheka. There are plenty of podcasts and academic literature out there about Karl Marx and communism if you're interested in that sort of thing. I think you can even listen to the Communist Manifesto on Spotify, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, j just, to, just so you know where I stand on this, because this can be a touchy subject, personally, I strongly disagree with communism. It's really quite anathema to what we enjoy in America and the West in general. Um, in doing this research, I've sort of come to the conclusion that communism on the scale of a nation, can likely only be enforced by an authoritarian regime with a secret police force. But let's flesh this out a little bit. Karl Marx was a German philosopher born in 1818. And as a young man, he was a journalist and worked, at, or worked for several different papers and struggled to earn a living, actually, for most of his life. What was Marx's issue with capitalism, though? Well, as nations pursued industrialization and more people moved to cities from rural areas to work in factories, laborers worked in legitimately awful and dangerous conditions. Labor was expendable. So a father trying to support his family could get his hand ripped off by a machine and render him unable to work. The company was not obligated to provide assistance nor uh, nor did they guarantee future work for somebody injured on the job. So they kick the poor sob to the curb and replace him with the next poor sob. Not to mention laborers lived in filthy conditions with multiple families in a single flat. People in middle management and the actual owners of businesses lived drastically different lives. They had wealth, access to education, and options. 
I mentioned Upton St. Clair's The Jungle in Part 2, where where Jurgis, the main character, works in a disgusting Chicago meatpacking plant in America in 1906. It's, it's stuff like that, but in Europe in the 19th century. Now let's toss in some basic economics, which I guess I have some credibility uh, in discussing since that's what I studied in college. No numbers or math here, just, just concepts. In economics, we talk about the means of production. You know, what does it take to produce a product or service? That would be land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Land includes, well, land, duh. And things on or in that land, like crops, minerals, or oil. Labor is people working. It's not just physical labor, but if you work at an office or from home and earned a salary or a wage, you're still labor, even if you have a PhD in data science, or you're in middle management. Capital are the machines, like computers or construction equipment used to produce all those products and services we just can't get enough of. And entrepreneurship is the people or person taking the financial risk of running the business. Think Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, I don't know. Insert entrepreneur here. What Mark saw was a fundamental conflict between capital and labor. Well, why is that? Capital is owned or belongs to the entrepreneur or those in charge of making the big decisions, i.e. those burdened with the financial risk of the business. Whereas labor is owned by, well, just that, laborers. White collar, blue collar, doesn't matter. That's you and me. Labor is owned by ourselves and is expressed by our skills at work, of which we collect payment in exchange for our time. But labor does not own any other factor of production. If we as laborers are rendered useless, like the example I gave of the father who lost a hand, we do not own uh, any other means of generating an income to feed ourselves or our families. That's, of course, supposing we just have income from work and nothing else. Of course, all, all kinds of people make investments, but This is simplified to get Marx's observation across. Oftentimes in economics, really, models and theories are tidy, but the real world is much more complex. We have to keep in mind that Marx was making these observations in a very different work environment than we have now. But I think at the very basic level, we still have this structure. Most of us go to work and labor using our hands, minds, or both for somebody or a company that owns the other means of production. In 19th century Europe, this was like severely true, and the wealth inequality was obvious. Of course, we have wealth inequality today, but perhaps back then it was just more stark to somebody like Marx. And you know what? I do concede that I see the conflict that Marx is highlighting here. It doesn't seem maybe ethical for a few individuals to own the means of production and for the common folk to only own themselves in a capitalist framework. What Marx envisioned is a system where the laborers of, or, or the proletariat own the means of production and not just a uh, minority bourgeoisie class. So when your uncle is raging about communism over his open grill at your 4th of July party, saying that the that in a communist society we'd all get paid the same and the the lazy would make just as much as the hard workers that's not an accurate representation of what marx was saying that rhetorical image is actually more like what communism applied in the real world looked like in my opinion it's not a redistribution of financial wealth per se i i think that is supposed to be the result but It is supposed to be a more equal distribution of the means of production. Everyone from labor to management shares in the success of their business. I may get angry DMs for this because I know I'm probably missing something or I screwed something up, but this is this is the gist of it. And again, communism makes me sick. I think I'm going to be sick. So Vladimir Lenin read Marx and sported an increasingly prodigious trouser tent with every word he soaked up in his bald little Lenin head. He's coming up with his own ideas. A key idea I forgot to mention about Marx and Marxism 
is that Marx thought a revolution by the proletariat would occur, would occur spontaneously and establish a temporary dictatorship of the proletariat. Lenin, however, saw revolution as needing a catalyst to initiate revolution and establish a permanent dictatorship. Lenin thought the catalyst for revolution would be a group of more or less professional revolutionaries seizing power and establishing a dictatorship with somebody like, oh, I don't know, somebody like Lenin as the leader. Here's where I find Lenin honestly to be kind of an arrogant asshole. In my opinion, it seems like he thinks the actual proletariat isn't or wasn't capable of uh, for lack of either organization, intelligence, or, or both, to stage their own revolution spontaneously. These poor people, these sheep, need to be herded by an educated, privileged, bald white dude from Simbirsk to be successful. Lenin just wants to help them, guys. He wants to help them so bad and makes, make their lives that much better. He's not doing this for power. He's doing this for the common folk. And here is another contradictory thing about Lenin. He basically has nothing in common with the people he wants to, air quotes, help. Nobody in his immediate family starved in the 1891 famine. He had the means to go to law school. That is honestly kind of the definition of privilege. I can't quite grasp what he must have been thinking because Lenin seemed honestly overconfident about his ideas and seemed to want to be in charge so badly. But at the same time, he must have known the likelihood of, of Leninism coming to fruition was a low probability event. Like literally anybody else could have seized power and had Lenin and his communist clans shot. I don't know. I, I, good, good for him I, for it working out, I guess. Bad for everybody else, as we'll see. Anyway, Lenin was arrested for rallying workers to demand higher wages and shorter hours. But he was so careful. How, how was he caught? Well, an undercover Okrana agent pantsed Lenin, exposing his revolutionary activities, we'll say. For this indecent exposure, Lenin was first sent to prison and then exiled to Siberia. As we talked about in part two, Exile in Siberia at this time was not the not an equivalent punishment under the Tsars as it would later be under Stalin. Lenin's time in Siberia was more like a quiet writer's retreat. His partner, Nadezhda Krupskaya, was even allowed to join him, and they were married during his exile. And you guys know what they did. They made Siberia hot, melted the snow and ice away, caused forest fires, and even made the animals jealous. I don't know that for sure, but maybe they did. But Nadezhda was there because she was arrested for revolutionary activity too, so it wasn't unreasonable for them to be together. Hey, you know what? Maybe you should get married in Siberia. Lenin wrote a lot while in his tropical vacation. His revolutionary essays were given to his comrades to publish back in the European part of the Russian Empire. Vladimir used many different pseudonyms for his writings in his career. He did this to keep himself anonymous from the Okrana and make them think that his uh, writings came from multiple different authors. The name that stuck was Lenin, but where does this name come from? Now, I'm not 100% sure, but he possibly got the name from the Lena River in Siberia. The suffix in, like I-N, in Russian more or less means belonging to. So Lenin literally means of the Lena River. So now he is no longer Ulyanov, but instead Vladimir Lenin. Stalin, too, had several pseudonyms, which we'll discuss in part four. After Lenin and Lady Lenin served their time in Siberia, they moved to Germany for Lenin to continue his revolutionary writings without the cops breathing down his neck. And here is another irony about him. He moved to a Western country with greater freedom ex of expression, to advocate for a revolution of which he would become a dictator and suppress free expression. He gets to exploit his privilege to use Western freedoms to publish whatever BS he wants, but will never afford the same rights to his people. Again, and I said this in part two, which I think shocked many of you, so please, please sit down for this um, or pull over um, because you, you may not like what you're about to hear, but uh, Lenin 
was kind of an arrogant asshole. At work, Lennon had zero tolerance for people who disagreed with him on any point of his opinion. You had to agree with him all or nothing, and you were scum if you didn't agree. Do you know somebody like this? Meanwhile, in Petrograd, a peaceful protest led by a uh, led by priest and Okrana agent Father Gapan attempted to approach the Winter Palace to petition the Tsar for better working conditions. The Tsar, now Nicholas II, ordered his troops to open fire on the protesters. This, of course, sparked outrage. Lenin caught word of the massacre and hurried his Russian booty to Petrograd to take advantage of the chaos. Lenin called for a bloody revolution and went as far as promoting murder. Eventually, the riots fizzled out, and some of Lenin's Bolshevik bros were arrested and sent to Siberia. Lenin, however, decided to show himself out and scurried back to the West, this time to Switzerland. Let's fast forward some years to 1914, and wow, do you hear that? Sounds like World War I. Let's go have a closer look. Oh, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. I'm sure it's safe. Oh, shit! The wartime environment actually cooled revolutionary fever in Russia. The only thing worse than an incompetent czar were the big, mean Germans. But it turns out losing a war can cause soldiers to turn on you. In fact, much of the army turned their support to the Bolsheviks. And that's more or less what happened uh, partly because of Nicholas II's ineffectiveness as a leader at the front. The Imperial Russian Army's lackluster performance was sapping morale and getting people pretty pissed off. I'm sure the Russian Army would never repeat such a silly mistake nowadays. Remember, Nicholas II was forced to abdicate, and the provisional government took his place. Lenin had bad FOMO, and was itchier than a kid in a wool sweater to get back to Russia. When he eventually returned, Lenin sized up the leadership of the provisional government, Alexander Kerensky, who is actually an experienced lawyer, like I said, um, unlike Lenin. Uh, Lenin couldn't smack down with Kerensky toe-to-toe, so he focused on persuading the masses to Bolshevism with some good old-fashioned marketing. They had a slogan right up there with, just do it, or eat fresh. The Bolsheviks promised bread, peace, land. Hell yeah! When Lenin finally returned to Russia, on account of him being a dick, he harshly criticized his fellow Bolshevik bros and the proletariat masses active in the revolution for mismanaging this opportunity for complete and total revolution. Lenin held the unpopular opinion that the provisional government should be taken down. Meanwhile, the provisional government tried to re-engage in battle with the Germans. The Russian army was not happy about this decision since the war was going so badly for them. And also, the war was a big reason for Tsar Nicholas getting pink-slipped. Lenin also found himself busy swatting away accusations of being a German spy. Because of the rumors and Russia's state of war, Kerensky banned the Bolshevik party for fears of Lenin being a naughty German boy. Lenin shaved off his signature facial hair, supposedly dressed like a woman, and hightailed it to Finland. Maybe Lenin was harassed at the border by a border guard thinking uh, he was a legit woman, and Lenin was like, Back off, asshole! Beat it! Broke my bag, the bastard. In 1917, General Lavr Kornilov, the commander-in-chief of the Russian army, believed that Lenin and the Bolshevik bros in the Petrograd Soviet were sabotaging the war effort against Germany. Kornilov ordered an attack on Petrograd itself. But really, what this was was a military coup d'etat. The provisional government reluctantly turned to the Bolsheviks for help. The defense of Petrograd was organized by none other than Leon Trotsky, Commissar for War. Trotsky organized an armed militia group called the Red Guard. And one distinct advantage the Bolsheviks had over Kornilov was support in the army. Another huge advantage was the Bolsheviks had the support of urban workers because they could manipulate the city's infrastructure to slow down or confuse Kornilov's troops advancing on Petrograd. For example, worker strikes hindered Kornilov's ability to utilize the vital railway network. Kornilov's assault ultimately failed, and some of his troops even switched sides to the Bolsheviks or just went home. 
Whatever the case, the Bolsheviks successfully defended Petrograd from a military coup, which made the Bolsheviks look strong and legitimate. They gained majority support in the Petrograd Soviet over the Mensheviks and the socialist revolutionaries. Lenin's nostrils flared when he caught a whiff of revolution wafting from Russia, and he scurried back to Petrograd to claim his throne. On October 25th, 1917, Lenin and the Bolsheviks more or less walked in and took control of key government buildings inside Petrograd, like the rail stations and the post offices. They stormed the Winter Palace, just barely missing the opportunity to capture Alexander Kerensky, who eventually escaped to France. And just like that, the boy from Simbirsk, Vladimir Ulyanov, who'd seen his brother killed by an incompetent, neglectful regime, had successfully toppled the Tsar's replacement government and seized power for himself and the proletariat class. The morning following the Bolshevik takeover of Petrograd, Lenin gave a speech announcing the overthrow of the provisional government and reaffirmed his promise of bread, peace, and land. In Petrograd, the takeover was nearly bloodless, but in Moscow, it was a different story. It took about a week before the Bolsheviks were victorious in capturing the city. Some historians argue that the Bolsheviks seizing power was the start of the bloody Russian Civil War. But right now, you're probably wondering, wait a minute, where is the Cheka? And you're right to ask such a question. They don't exist quite yet, actually. We will look at them just before and during the Russian Civil War, because their scale and purpose changed with the needs for war. We will also talk about the Civil War itself. The Bolsheviks seized power, so now what? Lenin's new government had a laundry list of problems, including the Germans advancing into former Russian territories in Ukraine and the Baltics, contention with Tsarist loyalist factions, and economic turbulence. There were widespread food shortages, rising inflation, rising crime, and just general unrest. All useful conflicts to exploit when overthrowing the uh, provisional government, but now Lenin needed to control these elements. And there was some period of time when, really, the Bolsheviks' hold on power seemed as loose as that of Kerensky's government. And Lenin still had a personal score to settle. You see, Lenin had not yet achieved complete and total revenge for his brother's death because remnants of the Romanovs still existed inside Russia, especially uh, Nicholas II himself and his family. Lenin's immediate concerns were to organize the Soviet government. They organized a council of people's commissars, who performed the functions of the Tsarist ministers. There were 15 members, with Lenin himself as chairman. The Bolsheviks still carried the support of the army and the workers. His support among the army was key during the revolution, because in order to achieve regime change, you need the guys with guns and military training. Period. Interestingly, Lenin repealed the death penalty established by Kerensky, albeit reluctantly. Lenin said that, quote, We are not using the kind of terror used by the French revolutionaries who guillotined defenseless people. And I, we will not, for we have strength within us. Lenin is referring to Maximilian Robespierre's reign of terror through the Committee of Public Safety, an ironically named secret police force that we will certainly cover in a future episode. Lenin made this statement a few weeks before seizing power. Despite this supposed suspension of the death penalty, the oppression was fast approaching. First, the non-Bolshevik press was suspended. They first banned right-wing, then liberal news outlets. Later censorship was placed upon socialist and anarchist media outlets as well. An interesting parallel to one of Putin's first moves to tighten information control. Next, Lenin ordered the arrest of the cadet or liberal party who were later tried by a revolutionary tribunal. Lenin then broke Russia's short period of time 
where no secret police institution existed. On December 20th, 1917, the Council of People's Commissars organized a more systemic suppression of political op opposition by creating the All-Russian Expeditionary Commission for Combating Counter-Revolution and Sabotage, also known as the Cheka. In Russian, it's... Um, so let's see if I can do this. Tsarosiskia Chesved China Komisia. Sorry to my listeners that speak Russian, that's about as good as it's going to get. So if you were to take that acronym and Latinize it, you get V-C-H-K-A. And from there, you get Cheka. Their semi-official mandate was to hunt and eliminate counter-revolutionary activity and sabotage. All persons caught in such activities would be brought before a revolutionary tribun tribunal and face punishment, according to the author... Uh, of one of my major sources, Ronald Hingley. But as we will soon find out, many suffered fates much, much worse than a day in court. The Cheka was an investigatory body like the Okrana before it, and was authorized to impose what were at first relatively light punishments, like seizure of property or withholding ration cards. Initially, the Cheka had only about 120 personnel. They wore grayish-green tunics with pronounced collars and sometimes shoulder insignia, depending on the rank. So these tunics, they're, they're kind of similar in, a, in appearance to Soviet military-style uniforms. Now, over the uniform, they wore long flowing coats or black leather jackets with a Mauser pistol strapped to their hip. A couple of sources noted the Cheka's affinity for black leather. Some said how they dressed really reminded them of the Oprichniki roaming around and terrorizing Russia. In Moscow, the Cheka took up residence in the Libyanka building, formerly occupied by an insurance company. Libyanka hosted the various iterations of Soviet secret police up to the current Federal Security Services, or the FSB, which we'll cover it in the last part of the series. On an organizational level, the Central Cheka operated in Libyanka, like I said, in Moscow. Regional or provincial Cheka were established throughout the Soviet Union, and it's estimated that approximately 400 regional Chekas were established in 1918 alone. The specialized Cheka agents embedded themselves in the armed forces, transport services, and among Red Army troops in the front lines of the Civil War. Historians are divided on whether the Cheka was conceived by Lenin himself or the Cheka's notorious leader, Felix Dzerzhinsky. Felix Dzerzhinsky was born in 1877 in Ivianets in modern-day Belarus in an aristocratic Polish family, also in a place of comfort and privilege like his contemporary Lenin. Felix was raised Catholic and, like his other contemporary Stalin, Felix wanted to become a priest. Unfortunately, Felix had poor grades in school and was expelled shortly before his graduation for radical political activity. He was a devotee of Marx and the revolution, of which consumed most of his time. He joined a branch of the Lithuanian Social Democrat Party and was arrested for distributing revolutionary propaganda and sent to Siberia. Felix was a bad, bad boy. The kind of boy you hope your kids don't hang out with because of his bad, bad influence. Felix spent a year in Siberia before escaping and spent the next nearly two decades, either in prison or exile. He spent so much time in jail, he missed out on the February Revolution in 1917. This was the first revolution that, that forced the Tsar to pack his bags and ushered in the provisional government, who actually released Felix from prison, but that decision would come back to bite them in the ass, since upon his release, Felix became a committed Bolshevik and helped plan the October Revolution in 1917 that forced the provisional government to pack their bags and ushered in the Bolsheviks. When the Cheka was created, Felix was appointed its first chief. 
And Felix loved his job, like really loved his job, like made him rock hard, loved his job. He spent hours working on investigations to crush counter-revolution and earned the nickname Iron Felix. Reading about Felix Dzerzhinsky, I couldn't help but think of um, my parents' cat of the same name. He's an Iron Felix of his home. That little gray tabby came to our home with his brother Jasper when they were kittens. And sadly, Jasper was killed when he was hit by a car since my parents live on a country road. And then the speed limit on that road is really taken more as a suggestion. I really can't tell you how many cat lives have been claimed on that road. But in 2015, Felix was hit by a car. And miraculously, miraculously, hmm, pronunciation, uh, miraculously, Felix lived and only walked away with a broken hip. And today, he's an old man, almost 20 in, in cat years, and as annoying and judgmental as ever, as cats are. Felix Dershinsky, however, was a staunch Bolshevik and incorruptible figurehead who should have been hit by a car, frankly. He was so enthusiastic that he was entrusted with the personal security of the main party leaders like Lenin. But beyond any creation of the secret police, strong organization was key if Lenin wanted to keep the ship floating. The Cheka faced many challenges at its onset, especially the Civil War. In 1918, Lenin's government had a lot on their plate, and like I said, their hold on power was tenuous at best. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, signed in March 1918, established peace with Germany and the other central powers in the First World War at the cost of territory taken from the Russian Empire, and leaving France, Great Britain, and the United States to finish off Germany. The Western Allies did not appreciate uh, Russia just seemingly stepping away from what they saw as an obligation to fight on. After all, the provisional government at least tried to put up a fight. Inside Russia, the economy was a dumpster fire, and the gears of mobilization for civil war were starting to turn. The Russian Civil War itself is quite a complex topic, and without dedicating a proper amount of time to the conflict, I could not do it justice here. At a very basic level, it was a conflict between political eras, Russia's past versus Russia's future. Again, some historians will argue the civil war started when the Bolsheviks took power, especially since a large population remained loyal to the Tsar. 300 years of Romanov rule was not just going to die quietly, right? And thus far, I haven't mentioned the most obvious fact about Russia, which is its geography. Russia is a big, big boy. Much of the rural areas, and most importantly for Lenin, rural peasants, had not yet been tamed by the Vol Bolsheviks. The Civil War was mainly fought between the Bolsheviks, also known as the Reds, and the amalgamation of various anti-Bolshevik forces called the Whites. Geographically, the Reds controlled the economic heart of Russia, that is, Moscow, Petrograd, and port cities in Western Russia. The Whites controlled the vast rural areas in the East. To complicate matters, several other combatants participated in the war. Former republics, once part of the Russian Empire, fought for independence in this civil war, including Finland, Ukraine, Poland, and the Baltics. There were also the Greens, which were a peasant militia group, and the Blacks, which were an anarchist group. Basically, anybody that opposed the Bolsheviks wanted to fight them. Lenin claimed that, quote, what we are involved in is a systemic, methodical, and evidentiary long-planned military and financial counter-revolutionary campaign against the Soviet Republic, which all the representatives of Anglo-French imperialism have been preparing for months. This statement sounds like the infantile shrieks of another certain Vladimir we know of. Lenin is basically saying that the West was out to get them, and that Russia's loss of these territories jeopardized their security situation and compromised the Russian sphere of influence. With the loss of Finland from the Russian Empire, the city of Petrograd was put in an uncomfortable situation because the Finnish border was now only about 400 kilometers or 250 miles from the city. It was decided to move the capital to Moscow, which 
is much further away from any European border. Supporting the whites were Great Britain, France, and the United States, and Japan. Us Americans actually sent our very best winter warriors from Michigan to join the fight. Actually, they weren't from Michigan exclusively. A unit was cobbled together made up of soldiers from kind of all over the US and sent to Michigan to get a taste of the cold weather before being sent to Siberia. You know, because Michigan is like, uh, like Siberia. I've never been to Michigan, but I'm sure it gets cold there. They could have just sent Team Minnesota. Siberia would be just like home. Even the Central Powers supported the Whites alongside their former World War I foe. Awkward. So to recap, you had the Bolshevik Reds, the Whites, the Blacks, the Greens, independent nations and foreign intervention backing mostly anti-Bolshevik factions. And I have to say, I chuckled at this situation during the research because here in America, a war between reds, whites, and blacks, and greens would be, um, how do I put this? A very different kind of conflict. The Bolsheviks' enemies dubbed Soviet-controlled territory Sovdepia, which was still quite a large landmass. Like I said, territory was ceded in the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, but the land the Soviets retained was probably the most valuable and gave them a huge advantage in the Civil War because it contained 60 million inhabitants and the industrial heartland. The Reds utilized this industrial capacity to outproduce the enemy in war material. Transportation and logistics relied heavily on the railroads to deliver troops and supplies to the battlefields. Some of the trains themselves were plated with armor and sported cannons and machine guns for attacks on certain positions. If the lines of track were located or captured, it would be to everybody's disadvantage to destroy them since the enemy's supply rails were also your supply rails. These steel beasts roamed the Trans-Siberian Railway and unleashed death and destruction. Evan Maudsley, author of The Russian Civil War, describes the conflict as, quote, a three-cornered struggle. Russian revolutionaries fought Russian counter-revolutionaries, but the national minorities resisted both. The Civil War was about what would become of all the peoples of the empire, end quote. I'm not going to get into that many more details about this conflict to keep the focus on the Cheka. Sorry, Russophiles. Maudsley does, however, estimate that about 800,000 military casualties occurred during the conflict between 1917 and 1922. But that figure increases into the millions when you factor in civilian casualties. Most combatants, if not killed outright, died from exposure to the harsh elements, complications from their battle wounds, or disease. Red troops embraced Lenin's cry to action. He said, quote, The proletariat must first overthrow the bourgeoisie and win for itself state power, and then use that state power, that is, the dictatorship of the proletariat, as an instrument of its class, for the purpose of winning the sympathy of the majority of the working people, end quote. Again, this highlights a blatant contradiction of Lenin himself, since he was part of the well-to-do educated bourgeoisie. Lenin must have understood that the average working Joe didn't understand and probably didn't care about the principles and nuances of Marxism. That is, if they could read. In my opinion, Lenin probably thought average people were below him intellectually and lacked motivation, so he swindled them into backing this supposed dictatorship of the proletariat, which was really a dictatorship of bourgeoisie Lenin. But, you know, never mind that. He even got to take a bourgeois dump in the Kremlin's bourgeois bathroom. But Lenin couldn't spend a lot of time on the toilet scrolling through TikTok. He had a red terror to attend to. The Cheka took this mission seriously and ramped up their use of torture and violence to a level like that of a horror movie, ushering in the Red Terror. The Red Terror was initiated in September of 1918 following an assassination attempt on Lenin himself. As we learned in part two, revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries were no strangers to using terrorism to achieve their political goals. 
Lenin was approached by Fenya Kaplan outside a factory in Moscow. She pulled out a revolver and struck Lenin with several shots. He was badly wounded, but not killed. In a separate incident, a young revolutionary killed the head of the Petrograd Cheka. And earlier in July 1918, the Soviet government announced its intention to employ mass terror upon the bourgeoisie specifically. We learned in part two that Lenin discouraged the Bolsheviks from using violence unlike the Socialist Revolutionary Party and the fighting organization. Any moral principle Lenin held onto then was most certainly discarded in 1918. One of Felix Dzerzhinsky's deputies stated, quote, We are exterminating the bourgeoisie as a class. During the investigations, do not look for evidence that the accused acted in deed or word against Soviet power. The first questions that you ought to put are, to what class does he belong? What is his origin? What is his education or profession? And it is these questions that ought to determine the fate of the accused. In this lies the significance and essence of the Red Terror. How interesting that both Lenin and Dzerzhinsky targeted people of background similar to themselves. If some other despot had taken over Russia, these two clowns would have been tortured and killed like everybody else. Dzerzhinsky himself stated, quote, We stand for organized terror. Terror is an absolute necessity during times of revolution. The Cheka is obligated to defend the revolution and conquer the enemy, even if its sword does by chance sometimes fall upon the heads of the innocent. No code of ethics. I will kill anyone, anywhere. Children, animals, old people, doesn't matter. I just love killing. The Cheka's red terror distinguished itself in terms of brutality from its secret police predecessors, with perhaps the exception of the Oprichniki. The Cheka spilled more Russian blood in five years than did the Okrana or the third section combined, the Cheka executed their enemies in all manner of ways, hanging, drowning, and firing squad, to name a few. Shooting was, however, the most efficient and preferred method, but those were the lucky ones. Cheka agents favored shooting prisoners in the back of the head. But why? This technique made the faces of the victims less recognizable. This is actually something we learn in EMT training. Entrance wounds from gunshots are typically smaller and present with less tissue damage other than the hole. Exit wounds are a different story. Because the projectiles may have mushroomed or created cavitation forces inside the body, exit wounds tend to be larger and frankly a bloody mess. A Cheka agent shooting somebody in the back of the head would leave a hole in the posterior skull, but likely wreck the victim's face. Some Cheka agents carried out executions while drunk or high on cocaine to take the edge off any personal squeamishness to killing. Particularly sadistic Cheka agents would shoot a prisoner piecewise, first shooting a person in the wrists, followed by the elbows, followed by another extremity to maximize pain before death. Conditions in the Cheka's prison camps were hell on earth. Prisoners were packed like sardines in filthy, pest-infested cells that stank like a porta potty baking in the summer heat. And in winter, prisoners were still packed in squalid conditions and exposed to the bite of freezing air. Torture was, of course, employed. Not every prisoner was subjected to torture, but those who were likely wished they were dead. Ronald Hingley notes reports of severe beatings and mutilations to extract information or for the Cheka agent's personal amusement. Some people had needles pressed underneath their fingernails. But even Hingley strays away from detailing these numerous other torture techniques, stating, quote, they need not be cataloged here, end quote. But not to worry, agents. I will talk about the Cheka's techniques, because on the Secret Police podcast, it's dark, it's bloody, and it's not safe for work. It's a ride through history only some will have the stomach for. We do not shy away from the gruesome details here. I want to share these things with those willing to listen, not because I want shock value, 
or provide sick entertainment, but to show you the depths of human depravity of which we should never descend towards as individuals or as a society. The next pieces of information contain graphic descriptions of torture as described by Sergei Petrovich Melganov, a Russian historian who authored a book titled Red Terror in Russia, which was first published in 1925. To make this source's biases clear, he was very much so anti-Soviet. What I'm about to read are the accounts of people who personally experienced the Cheka's horrors as documented by Sergei Melganov. They were the prisoners themselves, their fellow inmates who survived, and other observers, such as those who performed autopsies on the dead. Some of these torture methods may sound obscene or unbelievable, but other sources broadly corroborate what Melganov describes here. There will be no jokes or sound bites during this bit. If you do not want to listen to this, skip ahead about 15 minutes if you don't feel comfortable with descriptions of torture. Dr. Mudrov was a physician from Moscow. He was accused of some vague conspiracy and locked up in a Cheka general prison. When a plague of typhus spread within the prison, Dr. Mudrov became the de facto physician. One day, Dr. Mudrov was summoned for an interview with the Cheka agents. Several days passed before his prison mates discovered the doctor was executed by firing squad. Days earlier, no justification was ever presented. Other high-profile prisoners, such as a high-ranking military officer from the White Army, languished for months or up to a year, with no visitors, books, or recreation whatsoever. Only suffering was permitted. Every hour of every day was spent on a knife's edge, with the anxiety of expecting your execution, but never knowing when it would happen. A prisoner was brought to a basement chamber. Immediately he saw corpses in the dim light. Too many to count, many were wearing only underwear, most lay face down shot in the back of the head. He nearly slipped on blood pooled on the ground. A Cheka guard yelled, disrobe. He started to undress his shaking body overriding his inner defiance. Kneel, yelled the guard. He was pushed down onto a dead body. The guard grabbed the prisoner's hair and yanked his head violently back. And for a moment their eyes met. The prisoner, near naked and cold, kneeling in chilled blood. And the guard, with a smile on his face. A woman was brought to an execution chamber where she met her husband and several other members of her family. She was ordered to stand and forced to watch one by one each of her family shot in the back of the head. The guard turned his gun on her for a brief moment before. Instead of killing her, they read a pardon of her alleged crimes. Then she was forced to clean up the tissue and blood of her dead kin. Some people said her hair turned gray shortly thereafter. A former member of the State Duma, Ivan Ivanovich Kotov, was beaten so badly they broke an arm, leg, and caused one of his eyes to dislodge from its socket. He was executed in 1918. Another victim was taken to a basement and stretched across the floor. Two burly Cheka agents held the prisoner's head and shoulders in place, while a third smashed the victim's neck with a blunt object. This caused the neck to bloat while the victim coughed and choked on blood seeping from their nose and mouth. Dombrovsky, a school teacher, was tortured in solitary confinement after the Cheka found an officer's uniform belonging to an enemy army. The Cheka suspected that Dombrovsky's wife was hiding gold jewelry received by an enemy general. For this, she was raped repeatedly by Cheka agents in order of their rank. 
Then she was tortured to find the location of her rumored valuables. These men stripped her completely naked, carved skin off her body with knives, and crushed her fingertips with a pair of pliers. She was later executed in November 1918. The Cheka's Red Terror seemed not bothered with the limits of human suffering and misery. Some prisoners had leather bands wrapped around their heads connected with a screw and a nut. The nut would be tightened to place immense pressure on the victim's head as the leather band squeezed the skull. The Cheka inserted enemas with crushed glass into pupils' anuses and set burning candles under the genitals of both sexes. Some were forced to sit on a hot frying pan or be beaten with hot irons. Psychological torture was employed as well. One prisoner was dragged to the, quote, cell of the condemned and forced to dig his own grave inside a cell that already had 27 people buried in the ground. A Cheka guard then told the prisoner he would live another day. This was a common psychological tactic. Individual prisoners were informed they would be executed that day only to have their death postponed to some future date when execution would either be delayed again or finally carried out. If their death was delayed, the Cheka simply selected another prisoner, possibly one who received no forewarning of execution, and they dragged him off, kicking, screaming, crying, begging to be shot not far from the cell so the remaining prisoners could hear their cellmates' terrified anguish and their death. Nobody knew exactly when their demise would come. In another prison, victims were ordered to kneel with their necks outstretched. Novice executioners tried to cut clean through the victims' necks with swords. Some were successful. Others did not strike a fatal blow and continued to hack at the neck until the head came off. Others had hands, arms, and legs cut off first before they were decapitated. Later autopsies of the Cheka's victims revealed cracked ribs and skulls, as well as burns, mutilation, and decapitation. Melganov writes that one witness said, quote, the head of one corpse was completely flattened into a disc half an inch thick, end quote. An exhumation of Cheka victims uncovered women with their breasts cut off and their genitals burned. The autopsy revealed charcoal inside the vaginas of each of those victims. Other autopsies revealed victims with dirt in their lungs. They'd been tortured and then buried alive. Some victims were buried up to their heads and left in the ground. The Cheka would return to this grotesque garden of human heads to find most of them unconscious. The agents would then dig them up and provide some kind of medical care until the victims regained consciousness. Then they were promptly reburied up to their heads. And this would happen over and over and over again. Just outside Kharkov, an enemy non-commissioned officer was unearthed with skin flayed off his legs, hands severed, and his tongue cut out. Other officers were found with their genitals mutilated and their hands, quote, degloved of skin. The Cheka made human ice sculptures out of their victims by forcing them to strip naked, have a heated bath, then forced them out into the Russian tundra until they froze where they stood. Others were trapped in deep outdoor pits or cells, just wide enough to make it impossible for a person to shimmy their way up and out. That is, if they could get through the metal bars across the top of the pit. 
guards would pour water on these victims in winter until they too froze to death in a contorted ice statue. The Cheka called these pits the cold cellar. At prisons in the Far East, the Cheka had executed so many people outdoors that blood saturated the snow. When campfires were made and set ablaze, the snow would melt and send streams of blood running away from the camps, possibly towards Siberian villages. Imagine being a young child playing outdoors when you notice little rivers of blood edging closer and closer from the wooded hills just in front of you. You've probably been wondering, where has our Nicholas been this entire time? The Tsar and his family had been shuffled around from place to place until July 1918. Nicholas and his family were staying in a residence called the Iptaviev House in Yekaterinburg, Russia. Far from the luxurious living they were used to in the Winter Palace, of course. The Red and White armies were in the midst of bitter fighting, and the Whites were very close to taking the city of Yekaterinburg. If they succeeded, it would be a symbolic victory for the Whites to secure and preserve the Tsar and his family. Lenin was having none of this. On the night of July 17th, 1918, Nicholas II, his wife, Tsarina Alexandria, his son, Alexei, and his four daughters, Anastasia, Olga, Maria, and Tatiana, were awoken in the middle of the night by their Bolshevik handlers and told to get ready to move. The family got dressed and they were led to the basement where they waited. Hours later, several Cheka agents entered the basement. They read the family a sentence of execution and shot the family to death. Remember, Alexei had hemophilia, so if a fall could kill him, those bullets tore through his flesh like a hot knife through butter. Now, the children hid some of their diamonds and jewels in their clothes. So the bullets didn't initially kill them. Finding they were still alive, the Cheka executioners approached the terrified and trembling Romanov children and stabbed them repeatedly with bayonets. 300 years of Romanov rule ruthlessly put to an end. Lenin finally had his revenge for the Tsarist system killing his brother. All that I just described was perpetrated against men, against women, and against children. The Red Terror knew no bounds to ensure Bolshevism triumphed in Russia. Yay, communism. What a fun, family-friendly ideology. And to this day, some people still see this as a viable way to run a country. Folks, communism cannot exist without a secret police. I'll say it again. Communism cannot exist without secret police. Do I think communism is an inherently authoritarian ideology? Not necessarily. But does communism inevitably lead to authoritarianism? Yes. Because communism is unnatural to human nature. Thus, you need a lot of energy to make it work. In case after case in history, that energy has been terror. Forcing people to be communists is like pushing a giant boulder up a hill. You need a massive amount of energy to do the job successfully. But gravity wants to pull the boulder down. And sociologically speaking, gravity in this case is the pull towards freedom and democracy. One personal story and I'll get off my soapbox. A couple of years ago, my wife and I flew to Southern Illinois to see my aunt and uncle for Thanksgiving. I have very fond memories of their 
home in small town Illinois, and we did a lot of the same things that I did as a kid during that trip. We hiked, we picnicked in their cabin, or at their cabin on their farm, looked through their enormous collection of books in their library, played pool, checked out a Christmas light parade. It was a lot of fun. One night, we were sitting in their living room drinking wine, and I honestly can't remember what prompted this conversation, but my uncle mentioned that his uncle was a communist and wrote for a publication called The Daily Worker. For context, this uncle and his family, uh, his family's origins hail from a small village in Ukraine. Um, he told me the village, but I don't remember the, the name. I was taken aback because I personally highly disagree with communism, and I was shocked that somebody in my family would align themselves with such an ideology. But there is more to this story. So let me read a bit of what my uncle sent me in an email when I asked him about this. I have done the least amount of editing necessary to my uncle's email to provide context. And some of this will sound familiar to what we've talked about in the last episode. My uncle Maney and my father Zeke grew up in Brooklyn, in a largely Russian Jewish neighborhood. Their parents' generation had left Russia to escape both religious and political persecution under the Tsar. The political opposition to Tsarist rule was communist, in various varieties. Maney's uncle Jake actually went back to Russia to be part of the 1917 revolution. Uh, but he was a Menshevik, not a Bolshevik. So when the Bolsheviks took power, he came back to the USA. Jake's sister never left Russia, and was actually elected to be the to be the Menshevik parliament, but never took her seat. The community was so generally left wing, as Zeke told me, but in isolating that left wing spectrum, the socialists were considered on the right side of that spectrum, the far left were the anarchists. For Zeke and Maney's generation, the politics were important, but no doubt a bit theoretical until 1929 when the stock market crash and the subsequent depression made it seem as though capitalism as a system was broken. Communism was an attractive alternative to capitalism. But the Communist Party's ardent opposition to the rise of Hitler, Franco, Mussolini, and fascism was the greatest impulse to join the Communist Party because the Communist Party mounted the only real organized resistance to fascism. Communism, as a system, represented absolute social and economic justice. That it notably failed to deliver these things in the USSR was lost on the vast majority of left-wingers in the 30s. Beyond that, Stalin's murders and exiling of opponents to the Gulag were thoroughly hidden from view, especially from the too rosy view of American communists who saw the CP, or Communist Party, as the answer to the rise of fascism. And as a vision of racial equality in the USA, in terms of civil rights, the United States Communist Party was a generation ahead of the rest of left political parties. Maney and Zeke both volunteered to fight in World War II for the Americans. Maney, though he was much older than the average GI, ended up fighting in the trenches in Italy. When the American army reached Rome, his CO took him aside and told him he was too old for fighting and assigned him to write for the American military newspaper called Stars and Stripes. After the war, they all remained nominally communist in the face of McCarthyism, which actively persecuted anyone with even a loose association to the party. That allegiance became increasingly irrelevant anyway, especially as the truth about Stalinism became more and more evident. For several years in the late 40s, Maney wrote art criticism for The Daily Worker, using a pseudonym. I never got a chance to ask him about that pseudonym. Was it so that McCarthyite authorities would not get after him? Or was it so that he could write objectively about artists who were his colleagues without getting them furious at him? I suspect it was the former. I 
just want to reiterate what my uncle said about what was hidden from view. American communists were completely unaware of the horrors being conducted inside Russia. Even if American communists visited the USSR, that stuff would never be shown. What my uncle is saying is you don't know what you don't know. Does it excuse their attraction towards what I see as a flawed ideology? Not really. But can I understand that it was appealing because they saw the Communist Party stand up to fascism and it could possibly solve social, economic, and racial issues while not um, knowing how violently communism was being enforced in Russia? Absolutely. The horrific methods I described are mostly, or excuse me, were mostly conducted during Russia's bloody civil war, where territory between the Reds and the Whites was viciously contended. Some poor people could be caught in the clutches of the Cheka simply because they share a surname with somebody the on you know on the Cheka's naughty list. Former members of the bourgeoisie were of course targeted. One's former employment or economic status, such as being a landowner or associated with the czar, could get you killed. And some people were targeted simply because of their education or those who spoke a foreign language, you know, those people were executed. And again, <laughs> this sounds like Lenin's background. And Hingley emphasizes this fact, writing, quote, not that these guidelines were followed with full consistency. Otherwise, Lenin himself, as a former member of the gentry class, son of a senior Tsarist official, and tolerable linguist would have made an ideal political hostage, end quote. Yeah, Lenin, that totally makes sense. Indeed, there exists a Western understanding that Stalin was the architect of Soviet terror, but really the Oscar of best terrorist goes to Lenin and his co-star Iron Felix. Stalin merely perfected what they started. With the Civil War coming to a more predictable conclusion and a Bolshevik victory in 1921, the Cheka started to focus their efforts elsewhere. For example, as the Cheka um, spread themselves into the rest of Russia, they borrowed some infiltration tactics out of the Okhrana's playbook and embedded agents in rebel groups and helped crush these enemies of Bolshevism. So, in March 1921, at the 10th Party Congress, Lenin proposed the New Economic Policy, or NEP, which, surprise, surprise, allowed for a degree of free market trade, which was previously banned and labeled as speculative during the Civil War. But hey, they had to allow some aspect of capitalism so people wouldn't starve. A large demographic affected by the Civil War were children. Some 4 million children were left orphaned with few means of survival or adult support. Many of these children roamed rural Russia in murderous packs. That is super creepy. That's like some children of the corn level horror. The Cheka was tasked with building housing for orphaned kids at the expense of agents who volunteered part of their salary. And I'm not sure how many of them actually did that. In 1921, a dismal harvest in the Volga region led to a widespread famine that resulted in the deaths of an estimated 5 million people. Some of the desperate and the starving turned to cannibalism to satiate themselves. The American Relief Administration under then-President Herbert Hoover was prominent in trying to feed people. However, the Soviet government was suspicious of such Western efforts, and American relief was harassed by Cheka agents who saw foreigners as spies. Think back to my uncle's email. I'm not sure if Americans working in these relief efforts shared their stories of starving people in the Soviet Union when they returned to the United States, but I suspect they did. Like, how could you not talk about that? Seems really to me unlikely that American communists didn't know about some level of hardship inside Russia, but maybe they just like plugged their ears and shook their heads. By the end of 1921, Lenin left the, or Lenin felt the need to rein in the Cheka. Hingley writes, quote, Lenin was emphasizing the importance of preserving a greater measure of legality in political police operations, end quote. And on February 6, 1922, the Cheka was abolished. But don't worry, Russia couldn't go without its secret police. 
The Cheka's operations were taken over by a new branch of government created within the People's Commissariat of the Interior, and that was the General Political Administration, or the GPU. Yes, it's GPU, not GPA. That wasn't a typo um, on my part, or a misspeak on my part. Unlike the Okrana, who were abolished because they weren't good enough at weeding out um, political rivals, the Cheka seems to have been abolished because they were a bit too good at weeding out political rivals. And, um, you know, subjecting them to a carnival of sadistic violence. Let's talk briefly about the GPU. In 1922 and early 1923, Lenin had a couple of strokes that left him more or less incapacitated and confined to a wheelchair. He died on January 21st, 1924. But even before his death, he was fairly removed from the day-to-day -day operations of the government. Obviously, the death of such a towering figure left a power vacuum. This led to a lot of jockeying for power among Lenin's closest associates, and honestly, Everybody thought Leon Trotsky would take the reins. Nobody expected Joseph Stalin to ascend to power. Stalin and his rise to power is something I'll cover in more detail in part four. But for now, I'll stick with the topic of the new secret police, the, the GPU. I'll give this as much attention as I did the third section. Not the whole story but some detail, especially since part four will be dedicated to the NKVD and its variants, I think it's fair to shed some light on the GPU. So the GPU in name existed only for about two years until November 1923, when the letter O was added to the name. O stood for Objedinyonya, or United in English. The name uh, change The name change occurred alongside probably a more important name change of the entire country to the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics, or USSR. And when I was a kid, when I was a dumb elementary schooler, I thought USSR stood for the United States of Soviet Russia. <laughs> made, made sense to an eight-year-old. Uh, the OGPU wasted no time in establishing concentration camps and filling them with Stalin's enemies. They also began to infiltrate their own uh, Soviet institutions like the Red Army. Changes occurred within the Red Army in 1925 upon Leon Trotsky's ousting of his position as Commissar for War. Trotsky's replacement was Mikhail Frunza, who opposed Stalin's struggle with some of the old Bolsheviks who were part of Lenin's inner circle. Not only this, but Frunza went out of his way to protect the Red Army from the OGPU's infiltration. But conveniently for Stalin, Frunza had to undergo early 20th century Soviet surgery for a stomach ulcer, and he died on the table. Immediately, this raised suspicion that Stalin had something to do with the commissar's death, which he kind of did. What do you expect? It's Stalin. I just love killing. Interestingly, Frunza's personal physician actually advised against the operation, reasoning that Frunza's unspecified heart condition would be worsened by general anesthesia. Facing the medical advice of the physician, and not being a doctor himself, Stalin assembled a committee of what um, Ronald Hingley describes as a, quote, a pliant medicos, which basically means people trained in medicine who are easily persuaded. And, and this committee, not surprisingly, agreed with Stalin that the operation should be performed. There are some interesting things to quickly unpack here about this. First is that Stalin set a precedent that the Politburo, that is the highest ranking decision-making body of the party, had the power to enforce important medical decisions for its members. This started when even Lenin himself was subjected to care that he didn't really want. And second is that, according to Hingley, all the doctors who treated members of the Central Committee were themselves members of the secret police. 
These days, it would be insane if your boss had any say in what care you should receive or not receive, but at least in America, we leave that decision up to the algorithm gods of large insurance companies and our individual ability to fork out the Benjamins. The OGPU were also concerned with Russian expats abroad. After all, it was Russians, like Lenin, who operated abroad to topple the Tsar. So the OGPU had considerable interest in hunting foreign opposition. So let's take the case of Vasily Shulgin. He had been a deputy in the Duma and a far-right politician, but because of the revolution, he escaped abroad. He was successful in dodging the Reds and just wanted to chill, but he still had um, an incredible amount of credibility as an opposition figure. Shulgin had been contacted by an underground organization called The Trust, which was an anti-Soviet right-wing group inside the Soviet Union. The Trust contacted him to undertake a secret mission though, or, or through the Soviet Union. Shulgin wasted no time and crossed into Soviet territory to meet different members of the underground trust in, in Kiev, then called Kiev at the time, um, as well as Moscow, and in Leningrad, formerly Petrograd. After this tour, Shulgin was helped to leave the Soviet Union illegally. Shulgin went on to publish a book titled Three Capitals and secretly sent the manuscript um, to members of the trust to vet his work. The problem with this was the trust was fake. It was a false organization created by the OGPU. Shulgin's invitation to the Soviet Union, his tours around major cities, and everybody he had met on his journey was an OGPU agent unbeknownst to him. Their intention was not to hold him hostage inside the Soviet Union, obviously since they let him leave. Instead, Shulgin's manuscript was intentionally leaked and it appeared he'd revealed the existence of an anti-Soviet resistance group. It was a a huge ploy to make a, a former Duma deputy look stupid and to discredit him. And it worked. The OGPU had many front organizations, in fact, and each specialized in infiltrating um, whatever remained of any liberal socialist or anarchist group in 1925. A few years later, in 1928, the OGPU expanded its scope of operations and upped its capacity for senseless violence. They spearheaded the massive economic initiatives established by Stalin's first five-year plan in the form of collectivization and rapid industrialization. But remember, communism, even though it's so great, you know, for some reason had to be Im imposed by force. Hingley makes the argument that Stalin's motivations behind collectivization were purely political to crush the peasantry's last um, remnants of their independent spirit and embrace total conformity to their mustachioed master. The peasants had lived in rugged conditions and commanded their own land and crops. They kind of remind me of the spirit of the American Wild West. But Stalin desired that they be tamed like animals. Kill the culture of farming by taking away the prime commodity that lifestyle depends on. And I mean commodity literally, literally and figuratively. Tangible things like crops and intangible things like the peasant's free spirit. Stalin was only interested in harvesting free lives. Rural peasants were organized and dehumanized by class with particular attention to those deemed upper class. Three categories arose, poor, middle, and kulak. But it was the attitude among the peasants that they stood together, uncategorized in solidarity. Kulak doesn't seem to be an ethnic group or people the same way a, a Cossack uh, does, or the same way Cossack means but rather the term kulak was used to describe farmers who were less poor than their poor peers. And if my comparison of kulak and Cossack is completely wrong or even insensitive, somebody please DM me and educate me. So somehow the kulaks being the least poor of their 
of their poor peers meant that they were bourgeois enough to, you know, be served up hot for the OGPU's lunch. Kulaks were forcibly expelled from their homes and forced to live and work on collective farms like a good communist. Anybody could be labeled a Kulak and forced into collective farms, in fact. Years later, in 1942, Stalin was said to have told Winston Churchill that the Soviets had, air quotes, dealt with around 10 million peasants who were forcibly removed from their uh, villages through, quote, dukulakization. Those who refused went to gulags. Prisoners were shipped to various far-flung camps in railway cars, blocked in these things for weeks without food or water and exposed to the Siberian elements. When trains arrived at the gulags, some prisoners were found dead from freezing, asphyxiation, starvation, or disease. There were forms of resistance to collectivization such as peasants slaughtering their animals, so those items wouldn't end up in the uh, or in a collective but unfortunately this contributed to their to uh, their severity of a um, of a famine in the winter of 1932 to 1933 where approximately 5.5 million people died of starvation and over half of those deaths occurred in Ukraine even in this famine year the soviet union exported nearly 2 million tons of grain to foreign countries including the united states the russians would receive cash to invest in industrial infrastructure on the industrialization side of stalin's five-year plan industrial workers were not the victims of an overt assault on their lifestyle however life wasn't sunshine and puppies for them either they had to maintain a level of enthusiasm for progress and comrade Stalin. Hingley points out that a single day's work missed could result in one's immediate removal from their job. Some supervisors were made to sort of police the operations and work, uh, work ethics of the men and were required to report faults to the OGPU when necessary. People in Siberian gulags were expected to work too. Gulags were a poignant part of Stalin's Soviet Union that Russia had never really seen, uh, even under the Cheka's horrors. The gulags were distinctly different in the number of prisoners, the type of prisoner, and the introduction of prison labor. Because of the volume of prisoners, a vast network of, of slave labor existed in the Soviet Union, so much so that the OGPU controlled the level of timber output. So let that sink in. The OGPU controlled so much labor that they controlled the level of output of a major commodity in the Soviet Union. Even public works projects, like the White Sea Baltic Canal, were constructed using the OGPU's army of laborers. They started the canal in 1931 and completed it in August 1933 using about 300,000 prisoners. Honestly, I question the quality of work prison labor would produce, but I'm sure the OGPU got the quality they needed simply by pointing guns at the prisoners. Of course, the OGPU was no stranger to torture, having evolved from the ranks of the Cheka. Standard practice was to cram as many people as possible into tight, overheated rooms where there was nothing for the torture victims to do but stand for days. These rooms were often infested with lice, and it was apparently not uncommon for people to suffocate to death in such conditions. This would be hell for people who suffer from claustrophobia. Occasionally, OGPU agents would select somebody from these lice-ridden pits for brutal interrogation where a, a victim would be forced to run a gauntlet of both verbal and physical abuse. Meanwhile, Stalin was in his office waiting for a recording of that night's performance. What took you so long? You fucking walk here. He was frustrated that he couldn't yet just kill whoever he wanted in the Communist Party. Fortunately for Stalin, he managed to have his main rival Trotsky dismissed from the party in 1927 
and then exiled from the Soviet Union entirely in February 1929. Trotsky, by the way, bounced around Turkey for a bit. But while in Turkey, Trotsky was visited by an OGPU agent named Jacob Blyumkin. Stalin saw this meeting between the two men as treasonous and had Blumkin shot. His execution set a new precedent since Blyumkin's death was the first time both a party member and a secret police agent of some standing was put to death as opposed to being kicked out of the communist club. As for Trotsky, he ended up in Mexico City, where in 1940, he was assassinated by a Soviet agent via the ice pick in the skull method. That news brought Stalin, of course, great joy. Finally, Trotsky was dead. And of course, this news made Stalin rock hard. In another case of party member error, Martim Jan Ryutin distributed 200 pages of a document calling for the removal of Stalin. <laughs> I'm in danger! Stalin hoped the OGPU would just shoot Ryutin like they did with the other guy. But the OGPU actually exercised self-restraint, and they referred the case to the Politburo where Stalin was surprisingly outvoted. And therefore, Ryutin was merely uh, expelled from the party. Big mistake, because Ryutin and the Politburo members who stood up to Stalin would later face the torturous wrath of Stalin's secret police, the NKVD. Let's recap. In 1917, two revolutions occurred in Russia. The first, the February Revolution, saw the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II, the end of the Romanov rule, and the installation of the provisional government. Then the Bolsheviks seized power in the October Revolution of that same year. The toppling of the Tsar ushered in a unique but ultimately short period where Russia didn't have, really, an institutionalized secret police force. In fact, many revolutionaries, including Lenin himself, actively dodged the Tsar's secret police force, the Okhrana. Lenin himself said that his revolution would carry on without mass terror that was characteristic of other revolutions such as the French Revolution. Tragically, a peaceful revolution did not come to fruition. A new secret police was created and led by Felix Dzerzhinsky. We learned that the Cheka imposed mass terror and downright horror upon the Russian people. The Cheka were disbanded and promptly replaced with the OGPU. Lenin died and Stalin unexpectedly took power. Where Stalin left off is where we will pick up in part four. Lastly, one of Russia's holidays celebrates its spies in the Day of National Security Services Officers on December 20th, the same day the Cheka was formed in 1917. This is no coincidence this was done intentionally. Every iteration of the secret police from the Cheka onwards to the current FSB is really an iteration of the Cheka. The FSB is just the modern evolution of the Cheka. It's all the Cheka, guys. And a special hello to the FSB agent, that's been assigned to listen to my show. Here are some fun things I found doing this research. One of my followers on Instagram recommended that I watch this interesting animated movie called Princess Stories, The, Secrets, uh, the, or the Secret of Anastasia, which was released in 1997. Not to be confused with the, uh, the uh, Anastasia that uh, Fox did that same year. Uh, take a listen. Once upon a time, isn't that what all the great narrators say? Great. Once upon a time, in this really enormous place called Russia, which was cold a lot, but actually very beautiful, there lived this czar. In Russia, czar is like a king. Are we all on the same page? Great. And this czar's name was Nicholas II. It's really quite terrible. Like, the, the history is atrocious. This family all lived happily in this fantastic house, which was called the Imperial Castle of Moscow. C great name, huh? Well, it was a great place, too. Let me tell you. I, I, I think he meant the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. The music... Soon live free in the sun. 
sounds like everything but the vocals were done on a Casio keyboard. And the script and the acting. Well, Goofinoff, is she up there? Goofinoff. Okay, these two are supposed to be check it agents. This guy's talking to a crow. And he slips. Falls in mud. <laughs> you know, comic relief. Goofing off, where's the girl? Goofing off. Well, Master Grey, Master Grey man, sir, all my sources... This guy doesn't even remotely sound Russian. Sir, Grey man, sir, is that what we're calling you these days? Grey man? Ooh, that's good. It's kind of insulting. He hits him. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. It's all cringe. I mean, this, this movie is plain awful. In fact, uh, it was received poorly by critics because the movie blatantly ripped off both um, the other 19 1977 Anastasia film that I mentioned, um, you know, produ the one that was produced by Fox Animation Studios, and it also blatantly ripped off Beauty and the Beast. So, for example, it seems like they didn't even um, like try to get what Nicholas II um, looked like uh, right at all like they made no effort to do that he's shown to be short and stocky like the sultan from aladdin or santa claus and anastasia is followed around by anthropomorphic uh or by an anthropomorphic accordion harp tuba and cello each with their own distinct personality and each distinctly annoying spoiler alert in, because I because I don't I don't think you should watch this. Don't don't waste your time. In in the end, Anastasia finds out that um, her musical instruments are actually her family: Nicholas, Alexandria, Alexei, and Tatiana. Um, for some reason, they just left out Maria and Olga. But uh, whatever. There is no sight, sound, or pickled man meat of Rasputin in this movie. But the Cheka, unlike in the good Anastasia, is um, central to the plot. Open. Checker. Yeah, the checker. This is no neighborhood watch. This is no welcome wagon. This is no pizza man. This is no Ooh. right. Seriously, this movie is was bad. I, I'm glad my followers suggested it because it was it was so bad that it was funny to me and, and I just had to share it with you guys, especially at the end of such a heavy episode like this. Um, the video link will be in the episode notes if you really want to watch this. Now I want to share with you some of what's going on behind the scenes. You know, the last episode was two and a half hours long, and to be quite um, honest with you guys, initially I thought this was a mistake, especially since my stats at first showed it wasn't getting many downloads. But I really, act I kind of took it as a point of pride that I actually managed to produce something that was two and a half hours long. However, initially I thought its length was a deterrent. Later I realized it wasn't the duration but um, I made a mistake in not editing that episode as much. And I personally don't think it's as clear and well-produced as I would have liked. And I don't think that approach is fair to you, the listener. If I'm essentially asking you for over two hours of your time, my editing better be good with very few ums and reading stumbles. As far as duration, personally, I I like longer form podcasts. It definitely goes against the grain of stats showing that um, short form is more popular these days. But I like details and I like stories, and I suppose you guys too. And I think I think podcast listeners are smarter and have a longer attention span than they're than they're given credit. My content is always as long as it needs to be. Um, meaning I've never had a goal in terms of time. And so here's what I'm going to do going forward. I will shoot for at least one and a half hours, hopefully no more than two with tighter editing. In addition to that, I think it's important that I'm constantly improving my craft. So since the second episode, I've, I've joined some podcast Facebook groups. I've, re I've reviewed other podcasts. I've met some great people in the podcasting community who've 
uh, been generous enough to provide me with feedback. I've listened to other podcasts on how to make my show more engaging and how to be a better storyteller. And, um, and I finally upgraded to Pro Tools, which was an exciting but scary prospect because switching, switching um, editing software is actually quite daunting. There's a lot to... There's a lot to learn to just sound engineering in general, but just learning a different platform, I think is kind of a, is there's definitely a, um, a barrier there at the beginning. And so anyway, I, I hope these efforts pay off and add value for your listening experience. Y- you, the listener make the show and you've already been super awesome and giving me so far when I'm, when I wrote this 256 downloads in less than two months, which is honestly insane to me. You guys enjoy the topic, enjoy the concept, enjoy the history, and I love that I can bring that to you. So really, thank you for motivating me to continue to push out the Secret Police podcast. It it means a lot, so thank you. If you do like what you're hearing, please head over to Spotify um, and or iTunes and give the show a rating. Five stars is always cool. It's greatly appreciated and helps other history nerds find this crazy podcast. Even better would be a review if you're so inclined. No podcast can sustain itself without listeners. You can have the best content in the world, but if nobody is around to hear it, well then, it's like a tree falling in the woods when nobody's present. Does it even really make a sound? Hopefully, you found me mildly entertaining and learned something new. That means I did my job. And so please share this show with the people you love and the people you're kind of eh about. Hey, maybe even share it with people you don't really care for. I don't know. Do you feel comfortable sharing the show with your boss? Maybe you have that kind of working relationship. If you do, well then, you should share this sweet knowledge I'm sending your way. So you can follow the show on Instagram at Secret Police Podcast, or now you can follow me on Twitter at Hush underscore popo dm me for questions comments and feedback i love to hear from you guys get out there in the world and please don't commit any cheka level horrors if a cheka agent asks you to go to their basement don't do it agents dismissed